Hello everyone, welcome to the last 18 miles of the 2024 Mid-South Gravel Race. I'm going to try something a little bit different today with this video. I'm thinking of it kind of like a, a visual podcast almost. Um, I'm going to narrate throughout with no edits or cuts in the footage. So this is all as it happened, as it actually unfolded. Um, I recorded some pretty sweet content with this little onboard camera from Gravel Worlds last September, I guess. Um, and when I posted it on YouTube, it just uh, kind of took off, got a lot of views and, and a lot of positive feedback. And so I thought uh, maybe we, I should run this camera more often in races and see what I can capture from the most exciting parts. So. The, the trade-off with this camera um, is that it has just about 40 minutes of battery life, so I started it right before one of the last decisive sections and close enough to the finish line that I thought um, it could make it to the end. Uh, but jumping in here, we're going to get right into the action because a lot actually happens. I, I watched this once already, took some notes, and there's a lot to talk about. So. First of all, we have a group of maybe 14 uh, left in the race at this point. Um, just to kind of tell you where my head was at at this point, I was actually not in the most positive headspace. Um, I wasn't feeling amazing on the day uh, and also had had one of my bottles eject um, at the second aid station. So uh, I was out of water at this point, out of fluids, um, and it kind of rationed one bottle for the second 50 miles of the race. Luckily it wasn't too warm a day, but a minute ago you might have seen me kind of flash the bottle in front of the camera, and that was, uh, I was already thinking about you guys, that was a celebratory cheers to my last little swig of fluids that I had left. Um, I don't think it affected my race too much, but that sort of thing can get in your head a little bit, and I actually wasn't uh, super, super confident at this stage in the race. Um, that said, for me personally, I always know that the the later a race goes, um, usually the better for me. Um, and so even though we had a collection of, and we have a great shot here of kind of the whole group, a uh, collection of really strong riders, I figured if I could just hang on to the really pivotal single track section, which happens just a few miles from now, um, I'd have a great shot again. Um, so quickly to run through it uh, before we really get into the action here, um, I'm gonna read down the list. You just saw an Australian national champs jersey uh, fly by. We had just caught um, that rider who was in a solo break up the road um, and we're cooperating pretty well here. Uh, that was far from the first or last little break off the front of our group. Um, no one could ever permanently get separation. It did end up um, finishing in a sprint, but there was just kind of this constant ebb and flow of little attacks going off the front and, and we'd kind of let people dangle and then close it down and someone else would try. Always punctuated by a much rougher course this year at Mid-South. Um, it doesn't look too gnarly right here, but even on this section, there's some sneaky little ruts. It's loose um, and little corners like this, even though it's not that technical overall, um, the 90 degree turns like that come mile 80, 90, 100, the little uh, accordion effect that happens does start to add up. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to start the camera at this point is because Stillwater for the first time, the Stillwater area for the first time that I've ever seen, this was my fifth year doing this race, uh, did a little interesting road maintenance where just, they just threw down basically a huge pile of sand that was next to unrideable. Um, and so you'll see right here, someone's getting a little chirpy about the fact that uh, someone let the wheel go and you can see a couple of riders way up there on the horizon and the rest of us got a little caught out here and having to, to relay a bit. Um, anyway, so coming up, you'll see a really pivotal section of sand where I thought the race might blow up. And then just five minutes later, we hit the really pivotal section of single track. But before we get to that, let me run through this lead group real quick. Uh, we had Ted King, who I think won this race in 2018. Russell Finsterwald, who's one of the top gravel racers and someone I've been racing mountain bikes with forever. Nicholas Roach, who really needs no introduction. Spent a bunch of years in the World Tour. You're a sport commentator now. Um, won stages of the Vuelta. Pete Stetna, um, one of the top gravel racers, of course, also had uh, an illustrious career in the World Tour. Dylan Johnson, who, shout out, uh, I've actually been meaning to tell this to him for, for a while now at the races, really impressed with his year on year success, someone I used to race mountain bikes with as well, um, and has just every year made improvement and find himself at the front of these races late in the race more and more frequently. John Borstelman, 
another super strong guy um, who I just out sprinted for the win at this race last year. Michael Vandenham, who's been Canadian cyclocross national champ, I believe, and uh, is of internet fame for uh, putting his dislocated finger back in during a cross World Cup not long ago. Not long ago. I'm going to interrupt myself here now because we have entered the sand section, and you can see um, that we're all riding like right on the edge of the road. I'm behind Griffin Easter here, um, who's coming off of an awesome win at the Trans Cordilleras Columbia, epic race. Um, Congrats to Griffin on that. He and I won a Fort Lewis College team time trial together way back in the day. Absolute engine. Um, but anyway, you can see I'm leaving a little bit of room for exactly that reason right there. You saw Griffin go straight over a rock. Um, there's just so little visibility oftentimes in these races, and I would rather eat a little more wind um, and just be safer. And you're going to see that people are kind of swerving all over the place at times. I had two extremely close calls earlier in this race where frankly, I have no idea how I survived um, and just barely did so by the skin of my teeth, avoiding uh, crashes, which is just unfortunately an increasing part of the front of these gravel races as the fields get deeper, the speeds get higher and the courses stay every bit as rough and tumble as they've ever been. Um, things get dicey. So anyway, that's why I'm leaving a little bit extra space here to Griffin, even though I know uh, he's a great bike handler. Just having that little bit of extra visibility can go a really long way. Uh, you can see a rider, a couple of riders up on the left are, are pulling off, and I think they're going to kind of regret that a little bit um, in a second because that sand that they're riding in gets uh, pretty inconsistently thick um, and can be hard to ride through. Okay, so you see them really struggling now. All of a sudden, that's Nicholas Roach and Brennan Wirtz. Uh, so Griffin just passed Brennan there. Brennan wisely drops back into this little gutter section where we have just a bit of dirt to work with. Same thing though, I'm leaving a little bit of room. Um, I trust Brennan, I know his wheel well, but uh, that little bit of extra visibility helps helps a lot. And it's not a trick of the camera, like the amount of space we have to ride on right here, the reason it's just fully lined out in single file is one, because whoever's on the front, which we can't see right now, is definitely pushing the pace because they know this is a pitbull section. But also, there's only room for single file riding. Um, it's probably like, I don't know, a foot and a half wide that you have to uh, to safely ride in without getting squirrely. But we're already almost out of that section. About to make a left-hand turn here, which is why you hear my Garmin beeping at me. Um, turning left and off of that sandiness. Uh, but you can see it was still a little bit sandy there and Brennan um, has a bit of a gap open. Happens to the best of us, but now he's got a bit of a gap to close. And this is a fun thing. I had, I'm had. i glad I have my camera going for this. So watch Brennan closely. He looks back, he sees I'm behind him. He knows there's a gap in front and he had a plan here. Um, I don't know if he planned this before the race and this was just the right moment or this was just an instinct thing. But you'll see he's he looks like he's closing the gap, closing the gap. His body language kind of starts to change, looks over, flicks me through. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. You you closed about half the gap. I'll do the rest of the work. Um, so I cinch up that gap. But wait for it. <laughs> and while, while we're waiting for the special, special moment, a couple more names. Also up there, Alex Houses is in this group. Thorborn Road, Joe Laverick. Okay, I'm gonna pause there. There he goes. So Brennan basically faked that he was gassed uh, as as we were going across. Made me do the rest of the work. Waited for that junction to happen, and there's always an inevitable little lull in the action when two groups come back together like that, even when it's a small gap. And he just launched over the top. Um, my guess is this was a plan going into the race because he's not as confident uh, a single track rider. I mean, he's great at riding single track, but there are mountain bikers in this group um, who have a little bit of an edge. So my guess is he wanted to try to get a little bit of a head start going into that section, which is just a couple miles ahead. And you can tell everyone in this group has respect for Brennan's strength because all of a sudden the cooperation is on point. Like you can see the speed's gone up, uh, people are rotating smoothly. And as we're working to bring back Brennan, I'm gonna keep going through this list. So I mentioned Joe Laverick, a uh, kid from the UK, who's actually based in Girona, uh, who I raced Santa Vi with. He was second in the opening stage hill climb time trial um, to uh, my other buddy, Peter Vakoch. Um, and that Santa Vi hill climb TT, I also, not a TT, hill climb 
prologue. Um, I also had the camera running for it. I might upload that video uh, soon as well with this little narration component. Um, so you can see Nicky Roach is uh, he's rolling through strong here. Flicks me through. We're cooperating. Brennan's right there. Even though he the, he never got a huge gap, um, this is not someone that I think anyone was willing to just let dangle because he's such a huge engine. Um, <laughs> John Borstman pulls through real hard right there, kind of gaps off the guy behind him, who is someone that I am not as familiar with, Julian Gagne. Um, he finished in the top 10, or sorry, top 15 at the end of the day. Um, looks like he's a road racer out of Quebec, so he was also in the group. Drew Dillman was also in this group, although we don't really see him because he was cleverly very parked at the back. I honestly completely forgot about him. Alex Howes just rolled through. Um, as well as a, a young kiddo in that all-black kit, Isaac Allred, who I want to give a shout-out to. Super young, 19 years old, and is going to Fort Lewis College. Um, and I think that's everyone that was in the group. So that's, who is that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. We had about 15. 15 in this group. Um, I think that might have been me yelling because Thorborn Road on the far right is attacking at this point. Um, who Thorborn had just been absolutely throwing haymakers from like mile 55 to mile 75 uh, to the point where it was kind of getting ridiculous. I, I actually rolled up next to him at one point and was like, man, I respect your strength, but I don't totally understand your tactic because it didn't really seem like there was much rhyme or reason to where he was pushing the pace uphill downhill on the flat into headwind whatever um he was just going for it and so i think we were all very aware of his strength going into this final um and if he is so much as raised a finger we we're all on top of it uh, but you can kind of get a feel for the general tenor of the race at this point you know there's kind of these little attacks going but no one's getting a whole lot of uh separation for one Everyone's tired. You know, these gravel races are such beatdowns, even the shorter ones. Uh, Mid-South is just 100 miles long, uh, which is short as far as uh, North American gravel races go. But um, no one has a ton of snap left at this point. They're just kind of races of attrition. And then also our group is all, I mean, it's the 15 strongest guys, uh, pretty much by definition um, at this point in the race. And so... Uh, it's going to be really hard for a single rider to, to get any sort of separation. Um, one other thing that you'll notice is uh, later on in the race, this will become clear. Um, Dorborn and Russell Finsterwald are both riding for Trek. They're both on the Driftless program, which is sort of a technically a collection of privateers, um, hybrid kind of combined with a little bit of a factory team feel. So they start to play some team tactics games. Um, which will become more important later. Ted King here, shout out to him. I am uh, a good friend of mine, also a fellow podcaster. By the way, here's a little link to a podcast that he and I did um, at one point, our most recent one. We've done quite a few over the years, but it's just so good to see Ted back at the front of these races. He's, uh, he's had a string of really, really bad luck with injuries the last couple of years, and I love to see how much he was committed to getting back to the front of these races. And, um, is clearly doing it effectively already in March. So we're at a phase here where I actually didn't see this happen because I was, I don't know, 10 wheels back at this point. Um, but Nicholas Roach actually sneaks off the front at this point. Um, again, probably similar mindset to Brennan. He's looking to get a little bit of an anticipatory jump on the single track section uh, maybe doesn't have quite as much confidence in how fast he can ride that trail section as uh, some of us that come from a mountain bike background um, and based on the the way that the group is rotating at this point it seems like everyone is interested in kind of keeping him on a leash uh, but not wanting not too stressed about bringing him back straight away and we actually won't see him again for a while. Uh, he did a, a really nice move here. You'll see on the right, we're passing a lot of the 50 miler riders, but it's flat open road here, wide road, not an issue at all. You'll see in just a couple of moments, it gets a little more interesting with the 50 mile riders because we all end up in single track together. Um, spoiler alert, it doesn't really change too much, but it's one more variable that everyone has to nav navigate. And I think we all did a pretty good job of it. Um, now you see Alex Howes tightening his boa on his shoe. Uh, that is not because we are approaching the finish line and about to have a sprint finish. 
Um, it's because there's about to be a mid-race hole shot into single track, and everyone in this group is thinking about it. So we jump onto pavement here, uh, which marks kind of the beginning of the state park. Uh, I think it's Lake McMurtry State Park. Shout out to them for allowing us to use some of their fun, swoopy single track for the final of our Mid-South Gravel Race. So at this point, um, I'm already starting to think about positioning for the single track and balancing saving energy and staying in the draft while also keeping my left side open. Um, I definitely don't want to get boxed in here. Ooh, there's some potholes. Good job, John, hopping that. Um, so it's actually Isaac, the young FLC rider here, who looks like he doesn't have uh, any sponsors on his jersey at this point, repping the black jersey. Keep an eye on this kid, by the way. He's uh, riding super well. So I'm just kind of keeping my left shoulder open here, definitely eating a bit more wind, but I would way rather that and have an open line to jump around the outside and get good position in the single track versus, you know, maximize, uh, maximize my recovery. Um, you're going to see in a second, John Borstelman kind of opens it up um, and actually just takes off like a rocket ship. Super, super strong. Uh, I see him go. I kind of react. Um, last year, I took this line straight across the grass, um, cutting this corner. It's a little bit of a gray area, to, to be honest, in, in hindsight. You know, there's no tape there. And this whole area is just a big feed zone slash SRAM lounge hangout slash smith and it's just carnage there's people everywhere we're racing through there's you know amateur riders stopping for a breather there's these posts and then boom single track absolute craziness and then this is where things start happening really really fast just so pay attention so michael vandenham uh is right in front of me and he's all over the place slipping out he's an awesome bike handler you know world-class uh cross racer so i think he was just a little out of whack. Now I just yelled at Russell because he cut straight through the woods and went from second wheel, third wheel, um, all the way to first wheel and gaps the rest of our group. In the moment when you have race brain, you know, I, I yelled at him pretty aggressively there, used some colorful language. I was not stoked about it. Talked to him after the race and he was like, dude, I had race brain also. Um, I, I should not have done that and he, he made sure not to uh, keep that move rolling. And that happens, you know, when you're, and honestly, it'll happen throughout this single track section. For me, like you're, you're in such fight or flight mode, you know, the race is getting decided here. Um, and sometimes the way you talk to your fellow racers at 180 beats per minute is not how you talk to them when you're at a coffee shop or at the finish line. So bear that in mind, um, as we rip through the single track here, I'm definitely trying to get around Michael Vandenham at this point because, uh, little gaps are opening. Um, and you just never know, you know, we're passing 50 mile riders here and sometimes uh, just naturally they'll slot back into the middle of our lead group and little gaps can open. Um, and in really precarious Ryan. moments like this, that can actually decide you. your race. Um, so most of, I mean, all the 50 mile riders are being extremely gracious here. I did not hit that jump. Um, and, and getting out of the way as fast as they can uh, but it's, uh, it's a tenuous moment. Everyone's on edge right here. I'm in decent position, fifth wheel going into this, but you know, you can see how hectic it is. Like, uh, Vendenham's losing his back wheel all over the place, doing everything he can to, to, uh, stay in touch with the group. Um, and, uh, yeah, you're just, uh, hoping that you stay in touch and something crazy doesn't happen, uh, like a mechanical or a crash. It's really, um, a matter of kind of balancing variables, you know. Uh, try not to be too rude to the 50 milers all at the same time. Fun section though, super flowy, super fast. Um, definitely have to be on your A game. I have no idea what's happening Rider. behind me at this Thank point. Uh, photographer right there. Lots of photographers in this section. Yeah, I have no idea what's happening behind me. Definitely not stealing a glance behind i'm just fully focused on forward last year this is where our group went from about 10 down to three and i have a very strong suspicion that the same will be the case here again and i'm right now i'm just trying to read the couple of riders in front of me so both griffin and russell have now made it around john borstelman um, who's super super strong and his bike handling used to not be a strong point but to be honest he is absolutely ripping the single track section and does not seem to be having trouble holding Griffin and Russell's wheel. 
Um, so that's confidence inspiring for someone in my position, fifth wheel. And for that reason, you know, I'm keeping a really close eye then on Michael um, because it seems like he, you know, maybe it's his tire, the tires he's running, maybe he gambled a little bit on tires, but it seems like he's sliding around in corners a little more, at least early on. Um, and I'm, I haven't been 100% able to get a read on how he's feeling. So paying very close attention to, uh, to whether a gap is going to open up. Sure enough. Come on. Sure enough, a gap starts to open up a little bit here. Going on your left. And Michael is an awesome guy. I've been racing for, with him for quite a while, so I was comfortable saying, "Hey, man, I really need to get around and come around on your left." And he lets me by. Um, there are some racers who I would not have said, "Hey, I'm coming left," because they might have moved left to block me. Uh, but I know Michael, and um, I appreciated that uh, sportsmanship on his part. Now I need to get around Nicholas Roach who the other riders have finally passed. Um, he was in that kind of early anticipatory solo break and I go to go around, ooh, photographer, almost hit that photographer right there, nice camo. Hey, hey, so hey. right there, I I am very pissed off at Nicholas at the moment because I think he moved over to block me, um, which he did not. He was moving over to pass that 50 mile rider. Um, and we have a quick, exchange of words here that you quite, can't quite hear. He basically apologizes, um, but it was his only move. Otherwise, he was going to run in the back of that 50 miler. No hard feelings. We talked about it after the race. But now I have this gap to chase down, and I will tell you right now, this was a massive effort for me. Um, in hindsight, I probably closed it a little faster than I needed to, uh, but you can see Russell was out of the saddle there. They, these guys were going for it. Everyone knew that coming out of that single track section is where this race was going to explode. Um, and I was fully on my limit to close even just that little five second gap because before that we'd been doing 400, 500 watts on that drag, kind of double track drag, leaving the single track. And then this is the part where you, f you feel an enormous amount of adrenaline because you know the race is being made. Uh, again, I'm not looking back. I am fully focused on just making this group ahead of me. Um, trying my absolute best to recover. You can see that I actually kind of closed to the group and then I kind of got tailed off again, so I'm fully on the limit. Nice mountain biker line there from Russell using the grass, carry a little extra speed. Um, sounds funny, but those little things over the course of 100 miles, even when it's not a super twisty course, those two things add, those things do add up. Thank you, Escalade, for that nonstop honking. Um, Pass another, another 50 miler there. I would have loved to be right where they are right now to carry the most speed. But these things happen in gravel racing. Again, tiny little gap to close. You can see how high the speed is. Like Russell is out of the saddle just to stay on the wheel in front of him. Griffin is absolutely ripping today. Um, and you, I mean the body language of Griffin right there, you can tell he's feeling good. Right there, I'm pleading with Griffin, let me just sit on one more pull. And he's like, nah dog, sorry. I'm like, fair enough. And then this, another little gap, that's on me. I was looking to skip another pull to recover a little bit more from that um, gap I had to chase down coming out of the single track. Uh, gambled just a little bit, assuming Griffin might give me the benefit of the doubt. And he was like, nope. So then I have to close this gap, finally get on Russell's wheel. And we're just going, just trying to solidify this gap. I still have not looked behind me. That's one thing I've worked on the last couple of years is when the race is being made, when you're in the final like this and you're just trying to drive a gap home and, and consolidate it just focus on forward you know if they catch you they catch you um but but really put your effort forward so finally i'm relaying here going as fast as we can credit to russell for for pulling through um and pulling through hard too on this section you know he had thorborn behind him um and they're kind of riding as teammates this year, it sounds like. So, you know, he could have played that team card, um, but he was going full gas. You know who I, I think probably was sitting in, in a little bit in this scenario, though, was Thorborn behind us. Um, and the the onus was being put on guys like Statna and, and Nicholas Roche and, and the other guys that, it, that, that do or that are trying to catch back up to my group, which is uh, it's just four of us right now. 
So Thorborn probably got a free-ish ride back up here. I would be shocked if he relayed with the, the guys behind to close down his quote-unquote teammate here, Russell. Um, and at this point, I'm still thinking we have an awesome shot, but I also know how good the guys are behind. Um, and one thing I've noticed every year in gravel cycling is that it gets harder and harder to make these moves stick. I think there's going to be more and more sprint finishes with these Midwest gravel races that, you know, there's only so much terrain to work with. Um, they're just kind of rolling. They're not necessarily the, the, the most decisive courses. And as the fields get deeper, um, it gets harder to make that, that selection stick. So sure enough, we get caught. There's Thorborn. And he immediately counters. So assuming he got a nice ride on the coattails of Stetna and whoever else to get back to our group, he immediately launches. That's just Team Tactics 101. Um, and you're going to see Borselman and is, is pretty gassed here, understandably. Incredibly, Griffin, you can't quite see it. Griffin had the ability to go with Thorborn there, which is amazing to me. He was absolutely on a day to be rotating with the other three of us uh, in that previous move and then to be able to follow Thorborn's move um, Griffin was he ended up finishing second and I think at minimum he was second strongest today uh, there's uh, Drew Dillman haven't seen him for a while shout out to him for a strong ride he definitely uh, was playing his cards well hiding as much as he could you'll see in a minute I, I bark at him a little bit for opening a gap and Tell him, telling him to, to pull through. These are the things that happen late in a race when everyone's looking for that little edge. You can see that Russell is dropping back to the back of the group. He does not have to do any work anymore um, with Thorborn up the road. And we're just relaying as, as, uh, as hard as we can. Dylan Johnson there with his uh, arrow leg warmers. Impressive, sounds hot, but I guess it wasn't that one. I'd be curious to hear what the the arrow gains are versus the, the thermal thermal losses. I'm sure he's done the research. So those guys have about, I don't know, a 15 second lead at this point. We're pulling through hard. Dylan Johnson's pulling through really hard. You can see he's uh, gapping, gapping people off. Russell's not pulling through. Um, Drew Delman's not pulling through. So now it's just kind of four, four on two. Uh, Stetna, Borselman, Dylan Johnson, and myself. Um, hoping to bring this race back. Hoping to ride for the win. Right here, I'm slam I'm braking early because I see this big road crossing happening. Sure enough, a car comes through. I do not love that about some of these gravel races. Um, although I will say... <laughs> there I'm giving Russell a hard time about the team tactics in a good-natured way. So the funny thing is with uh, with the Driftless program, so they share Trek Bikes as a sponsor, but they have different other sponsors. So right there, my comment to Russell was, so if Thorborn wins, are you going to uh, make a post for Pearl Izumi, who's Thorborn's kit partner and not Russell's kit partner? Um, all in good fun. Anyway, that road crossing... Um, Mid-South did an amazing job this year of locking down downtown. Best traffic control I've seen at this race ever. Felt really, really safe. The first time, you know, the last few miles of this race, I felt like you can actually race flat out. Uh, that road crossing back there, though, did not have any traffic control, and it was a little dicey. We probably lost, I don't know, a couple seconds um, having to slam on the brakes there last minute. But personally, I would much rather lose a couple of seconds than uh, get hit by a car. Speaking of getting hit by things, those motos were pretty close. We had uh, 50 mile riders on the right side, motos on the left side. These are very dynamic races. There's always something happening. So at this point, my confidence is sky high. I see that we're gradually bringing those two guys back. I'm feeling way better. Um, I have confidence in my sprint. And then unfortunately, disaster strikes. Feel my back tire starting to go soft. Um, so I don't know why I didn't slam on the brakes immediately here. <laughs> Probably just a uh, little bit of having trouble coming to terms with the fact that I have a low tire seven miles from the finish. But there goes the media car. Sure you're good, but 
stopped here diagnosing um, diagnosing the issue and it was either a pinch cut or burp right behind the the rim and so at this point I'm laying the bike down on its side um, trying to get sealant there right with the there goes uh, Brendan Wirtz's chase group laying the bike on its side um, just trying to get that sealant to to plug whatever leak happened and I did get it to seal up didn't have to put a plug in took about 45 seconds got rolling again but with seven miles to go that is absolutely the end of my bid um, to to win this race or, or finish on the podium so a real bummer um, but I've had a lot of good luck at this race in the past and and although I was really gutted you know the the incredible atmosphere that this race has back at the expo area and the finish line and how Bobby and, and the entire Mid-South team does such a good job of celebrating the entire field. Oh, dog. Uh, <laughs> it uh, it kind of soothed, soothed the frustration um, a lot more than would have been the case probably at another race. And even still, at this point, I am bumming hard. Um, and right behind me are Ted King and Joe Laverick. Um, and I'm sort of like cut caught in this uh, little rock and hard place where I'm like, do I keep riding hard or I just just chill out and, and meet up with my friends and roll across the line for 12th or whatever it ended up being. Um, and we're going to fast forward. Ultimately, I decide to sit up and wait for those guys and, and roll in with some buddies. So we'll skip ahead a little bit. Um, and here I link up with my boys. My pulls might be a little slow. Yeah, so when I when I hit my wheel with the CO2, um, it sealed, uh, but it was still losing air a little bit. Um, got me home, but we're sort of a, a trio of a shit show right here. So Joe lost his DI2, so he's out of gears. I have about 5 PSI in my back tire, and poor Ted, who is uh, on his comeback... Um, is kind of left with the majority of the work to do, <laughs> but we end up rolling in together. Uh, the camera dies actually like a mile or two before the actual finish. Um, and to be honest, not a whole lot more happens. All of the excitement through the single track and, and the, the group dynamics of the past few minutes, unfortunately, kind of fizzle out. And I have quite the anti-climax to my 2024 Mid-South. But with that said, I think I'm gonna keep doing this. Um, I'll keep carrying this little camera around for the races, try to capture some exciting stuff, do little narrations um, over these. If you found this interesting, please leave a comment, let me know. Um, there's definitely some work involved, so I don't wanna commit to these unless uh, it seems like they're gonna be enjoyed. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any uh, feedback or, or other ideas, ways to uh, ways to improve them. Um, I will go ahead and do this for a couple of the Centify uh, stages as well, stage one and stage two. Um, so you can look for those on YouTube very soon. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, following along today. And if you want to listen to the podcast, our Mid-South Recap podcast, where we interviewed the last place finisher, um, as well as... Uh, had a huge montage of uh, all of the sound bites, 45 to 60 second stories that listeners sent in. Um, you guys can uh, check that out on Spotify or iTunes. Otherwise, uh, thanks for following, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Ciao.